I'd like to welcome Dr Jens Klump from the CSIRO who's going to be taking us through both DOIs, Digital Object Identifiers, and IGSMs for geological sample numbers. A few words to introduce myself. So my background is in geology. I did undergrad in, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in geology and oceanography and then carried on to do marine geology back in Germany in Bremen, did a loop through IT industry and then joined the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam in 2001, which where well, I stayed until the beginning of this year. And in March 2014, uh, joined CSIRO as the OCE, which means Office of the Chief Executive, Science Leader, Earth Science Informatics. And my previous work was to support something which could be called the digital value or data value chain to understand how researchers work in geosciences and develop projects with them and then integrate the data that come in from heterogeneous sources, help people adopt new technologies, and just to keep an eye of which of these new technologies can be used in the geosciences. So the main topic of today will be the DOIs and the IGSNs. And I start with the more well-known topic of the digital object identifiers for data publication and citation. And my focus will be on how this was intended to make data part of the record of science. That will be the guiding principle for the discussions from my perspective. So when the internet was still young, um, this was one of the errors that popped up very early on and it's been around with us ever since. And in terms of the record of science and having science on the web, this meant that things were broken and that one of the terms was called link rot. So this problem of link rot was um, recognized very early on and this gave rise to the development of the handle system, which was introduced in 1995. And based on the handle system, the publishing houses introduced the digital object identifier. It was proposed in 1997 and went into production in 1998. And this was also the first time when somebody suggested that maybe these new digital object identifiers could also be useful for identifying data. So that started the, the project um, in Germany with the first DOI for data then being minted in 2004. So we're at the 10 year anniversary now in the context of a project funded by the German Research Foundation. But if you want to run this as a sustained business, as a sustained service, you have to find a business model that expands the use of these digital object identifiers to an international scale. And international scale also meant that the original service provider, the German National Library for Science and Technology, was, not, was a bit of a problem in that the French and the Swiss and others, other national libraries were uncomfortable with, with using a German national library as the service provider. So something else had to be found and that was Datasite. Datasite was founded in 2009 as an organization to um, govern the system of digital object identifiers for data. So it has 31 members today. Last I looked, there were 3.6 million data sets registered, of which 1.2 million were in the last 12 months. So there's been a huge upsurge in use. But if you compare this to 1.8 million articles published in various fields of science in 2012, then um, the number of data sets that have been registered is actually pretty small. And some of those data sets, when you look at them, um, you can, if you Google data side statistics, you can see the fine-grained statistics and you will see that many of these data sets a very fine grain. So even though 1.2 million in 12 months sounds impressive, it doesn't really reflect the output of papers published. So it's still lagging behind, but it's catching up fast. So the original idea was we have data in traditionally published in papers. And on the left-hand side, that's a typical journal page. You have some tabulated data, but the really interesting part is this illustration in the 
right hand column, um, which some people call a buckshot scattergram uh, with dots and disks. And it nicely serves the purpose of illustrating the main idea of this paper of, in this case, uh, calculated chlorophyll versus measured chlorophyll in Lake Baikal in Siberia. But that's about where it stops. And you cannot use this any further. It just illustrates the thought. Fortunately, in this case, if you take the DOI at the bottom of the page, it does resolve to something. We put the data from this paper onto the scientific drilling database, which is a database for data from scientific drilling pro projects. And this um, repository then gives you a description of the data. It gives you a way to cite the data and points to related materials like the uh, the paper where this um, data are interpreted. You can download the data and you can also download metadata in various formats like ISO 19115 for uh, georeference data, NASA directory in data interchange format, which is, goes back a bit further in time, the data site metadata. And in, for this particular system that underlies the scientific drilling database, also the ESIDOC um, metadata. But the point for with, with metadata here is that there are many ways to describe things and um, this particular system can cater to any description that you seem fit or necessary to describe your data set. So DOI for data, the resolution question is solved. So there's a way to go from a digital object identifier to the universal resource locator. And this resolving service is provided by the handle service. Fine, so we can find things that we can name, but what do we name? So there's the question of granularity. What is the smallest identifiable object that we actually want to identify? What exactly is identified by a particular DOI? How do we go about versions if we update things, if we do corrections, if we have errata? And in anything that's in the environment, particularly time series are very important. How do we deal with continuing time series, for instance, from environmental monitoring? Those questions arose very early on in the, in the precursor project to the DOI for data already. And I think the principles haven't really changed. Some use cases have become a bit more refined. But the underlying questions are still granularity, identity, versioning, time series. And this goes back very far to the earliest source that I found was the year 75, Kutai, uh, describing the ship of Theseus paradox. In the ship of Theseus paradox, Theseus comes to port once a year with the ship and changes a plank or two. And does the same thing the next year and so on. And in year N, N number of planks of the ship have been changed. So is Theseus ship still the original ship, even though many of its components have changed? And things become even further complicated when you collect the planks and build a second ship constructed out of Theseus ship's old planks. Which of the ships is the original? This is a um, question that's quite vexing and a uh, solution has only, well, there have been many discussions about it, but the, one of the solutions that I found is actually not that old, asking the question, so can anything, well, Thesaurus' question is, can anything be identical with another object? Um, or are we looking for an equivalent identical object, which in the case of, digital object identifiers is a good question of what are we actually looking for? What is represented by the identifier? And as an aside to the Theseus paradox, the ship of Theseus paradox, formally this can be approached by introducing the concept of perdurantism. And the per perdurantists say that an individual has distinct temporal parts throughout its, its existence. So the ship of Theseus at any year has its distinct temporal existence and over time it's identical with itself. This is the antipode to the endurantism where the view is that an individual is wholly present at every moment of its existence. And I think with 
many of the things we're dealing with, the endurantist view produces some problems. The perdurantist view is more pragmatic, but that's something I will leave to the philosophers. <laughs> and I want to go through some of the use cases of digital object identifiers. So the first and easiest use case is the single item produced at time t0. And we're going back there t1 and t2, and it hasn't changed. That's very easy. We give it one name, and we can always refer to it by that name. And then we will have a resolving service that will then point us to its location. Now, if we have a time series, then it starts at t time t1. We can go back to it at t1. At t0, we can go back to it at t1. And then there's something that has been appended to this time series. And when we go uh, at t2, more has been appended, but the past record hasn't changed. And that's an important point. The past record hasn't changed. So we can go back to it. Introduce this use case to the project early on when we were looking at time series coming from satellites where the past record didn't change, but the, it was only appended. And we, in the old business model, we would have to pay for the DOI. So we weren't prepared to pay millions of dollars for DOIs. Uh, we wanted to pay for just one DOI per data set, arguing that you could always go back to the old record. It just became longer, like in the days of library index cards, where you had one library index card saying nature 18 something dash and you wouldn't have an an index card for every issue of nature you would have only one for the series which was an, an, an ongoing series now if you update an item things are somewhat different so we start at t0 with some item then at t1 we update the item and at t2 we update it again indicated by different color bars in this box. So there are some use cases where I want to go back to a very specific version of that data set. And each of these versions is identified by a different identifier. We have the DOI1 name, the DOI2 name, DOI3. But sometimes some people will only be interested in the most current version. And that is something that you can approach by creating what we call a parent object. Uh, this DOI A name in this case is the parent to DOI 1, 2, and 3. And when you refer to DOI A, it will take you to the most current version. If you want a specific version, you can address that very specific version by its own name. The snapshot is a different variant of the same theme here it's a mixture of up, updated item and time series it follows the same principle that you can um, go back to a very specific version or you can go to the current version depending on what your use case is and where you want to go also very useful is this concept of a collection where um, you have several objects several data objects that are then compiled into a collection by a parent object. And this, for instance, can solve the question of how do I cite many hundred data sets in a publication? If I don't want an, a huge citation list, you can create a collection and then cite that collection, which then cites all the uh, child data sets. And this is an example of, of uh, collection. You can also resolve that DOI. This is a series of maps of the Lake Baikal region. It's also a supplementary material to, a, to an article. So we didn't actually put all the maps into the citation list at the end of the article. We referred to this collection. Um, there are other examples of that as well. You can find, and this I think is very a useful and elegant solution to um, bundling many data sets into one collection and then referring to that as, as one and not as 500. One of the things that then appear is we have so far talked about collections and repositories, but now we're approaching a, we're in an age where we're not dealing with 
handcraft the data in all cases anymore. We're starting to use services. And this is uh, certainly a question that will be discussed, I think, also later today in, um, in a workshop that how do we deal with this when we when we look at it from a services perspective? If if it's file based, it's it's easy um, in that sense that it's easy to identify what we're referring to, a pretty generic approach, and it's close to the original record of science because we're working with something that's very close to the original materials, and it's easy to make this compliant to the open archival information systems reference model. But when we want to use this in the context of user agents of machines, then this would often require manual interventions, downloading data and then transforming it into something that machines can use. On the other hand, if we approach this from a services perspective, that's machine friendly and the use of the data can be automated. But the storage, if we store things as a service, is not OAIS compliant does not fit with the open archival information systems model. And the Pangea database, for instance, has had run into that problem. So now they have to keep a double record. <laughs> they have to keep the original materials that they receive, plus use that as a stage to create the services that they then disseminate. You can, that's certainly a way that you can go to start file base and then transform things into services. But there's certainly an ongoing debate and things that need to be solved. Now, the international geosample number is something that we developed based on the idea of the digital object identifiers with a slightly different use case. And now we're touching on something that is now also called the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, when you look at the Wikipedia <laughs> definition, is the Internet of Things refers to uniquely identifiable objects called things and their virtual representations in an internet-like structure. And in geology, the specimens are one of the basic units of geoscience observations. They are basic units for data reporting because measurements are being done on them. And they are also basic units for data discovery, access, and analysis because people refer to them. So creating access to this information about the samples or specimens is essential for evaluation and the interpretation of the specimen-based data. And certainly it would be desirable to have access to the physical specimens to allow us to build more comprehensive data sets and, and reuse these resources and the data resources. But until recently, there was no standard way to access information about specimens. There are few online repository catalogs. There are very few disciplinary catalogs. And the metadata found in the publications is incomplete if, if anything is reported at all. Um, just to <laughs> illustrate the case, this is the locations of rock specimens in the EarthCamp database called M1. So you can see that M1 is globally distributed. There's a certain fondness for M1 in Japan. And in terms of the rock type, M1 is anything. So M1 clearly is not a useful name to use. It's something that, if you find this in the literature, doesn't get you anywhere. But even when the names are unique, it doesn't help much if it's not linked to anything. This is a case that I stumbled across when I looked at marine drilling data. I wanted to run a model for a sensitivity study. And my colleagues told me, you know, the numbers you are using in the study, are they don't seem realistic. Where did you get them from? I said, I got them from the literature. Yeah, but maybe they got them wrong. So I meditated over this paper and this map and thought, should I write to China now to ask for the numbers, or should I find, is there any other way that I get hold of the numbers? So I recognized SO95-5 and SO95-20, and thought, hmm, maybe this was a site survey cruise for an international drilling, ocean drilling program campaign. So I checked the Pangea database to see whether the cruise SO95 existed. And it did. So it gave me a lead to 
then go to the CEDIS database of the International Ocean Drilling Program or Integrated Ocean Drilling Program at the time to see whether the drill holes 1146, 1147, etc. existed. And yes, they were there. And I did find the data I was looking for, and I could verify my claim that about these, these numbers. So having this in-depth knowledge of how ocean drilling works, I could trace the numbers, but it could have been so much easier if the materials had been identified by international geosample numbers. The data were identified by DOIs at least, so that there would be a way of looking those up if they had been reported, but unless there weren't. So there's room for improvement, which could look like this. So you start searching for something using your favorite search engine, you find the paper that has a DOI to the data sets that are interpreted in this paper, and then maybe these data will point you to other papers that are based on or offer different interpretations. Maybe there's a more detailed data publication in a journal like Earth System Science Data and point us to the materials that are uh, the basis of these uh, measurements. That's how things, I think, will work in the future. Then we're getting there. There are, we are, when, well, they're not, we're not the only ones talking to the publishers. There are several initiatives uh, trying to make things more interconnected. Why did we use digital object identifiers for specimens? Because digital object identifiers means it's a digital object. It's a digital identifier for an object. It's not simply an identifier for a digital object. So we could have used them for specimens. But just historically, the German National Library for Science and Technology, TRB Hannover, didn't want to do that because it wasn't part of their scope. This was a really formal decision to go a different way. And this was before the before DataSite was founded that they made that decision. And so we went separate ways. It could be discussed to merge the systems again. At the moment, we're keeping them separate because the use case of dealing with physical specimens called for a different set of rules even though the structures that we put in place uh, are very similar to data side. So the governance of these systems is a very important issue. The technicalities are fairly simple. If you want to base them on the, on the handle service, the infrastructure is basically there. Um, and then you build services that are technically actually not too demanding, but to govern the system in a way that the names are unique that the names are persistent, that the links are also as persistent as possible. That is a different matter. So since IGSN and DOI are both based on the handle system, it will be easy to merge IGSN with data site in the future if things go that way. We'll see. Maybe that it will, maybe things will go in a different direction.